right, we are live here, 3-4-2019. Matt, uh, halftime report from TackleTrading.com. Market is selling now for the first time in some time, but it's not really selling aggressively. Much needed, probably pullback here that is developing. First off, how are you doing this morning, brother? You know, Tim, doing really, really good. Uh, excited to be here with Halftime Crew and uh, to get people ready for the market this week. We got a lot to coming up and uh, we got a lot to uh, get people ready for. You know, on Market Prep Monday, what we're going to do is we go through the full economic calendar. We talk about all the different sectors, do a full market analysis and kind of get you ready for the week. If you are watching our show, always give us a quick like and a comment. Love to have you guys here and welcome out Halftime Crew. You know, Matt, on this day in 1933, FDR was inaugurated, uh, you know, starting the New Deal in the 1930s, 1940s. What a great president. What, what's your memory when you think of FDR first off, just as a president? Uh, yeah, first of all, one of the top five presidents for me. Uh, I mean, any, it, for me, in ranking the presidents, it always starts with the adversity that they have to go through, right? Things that they inherit, things that they have to go through. You know, one of the reasons people, you know, looked to Abraham Lincoln was it wasn't necessarily the Emancipation Proclamation because that didn't come through 1962. It's how he handled the Civil War, right? It's uh, we look at George Washington and we revere George Washington because of how he handled the Revolutionary War. Uh, we look at FDR because of uh, how he handled the Great Depression. And but, you know, the New Deal and, you know, uh, FDR gets a lot of credit or blame, depending on your political perspective for the New Deal. Uh, but when when I look at what was going on in the 1930s, what else was what else was you going to do? We were going through one of the worst economic calamities that this country has ever seen. People couldn't afford to even put basic goods and uh, uh, couldn't afford basic goods and services, couldn't put food on the table. Uh, you were dealing with massive rates of unemployment. And from a capitalistic perspective, uh, you would say, well, don't do anything. Well, that's not what John Cain said. And uh, that was so when, when I think of FDR, I think of. You know, the New Deal, obviously, I think of World War II and his response in World War II. I think about how he handled Pearl Harbor. I, I think about the Glass-Steagall Act in 1933. And, and I think about John Gaines. And, and I definitely would, would put, you know, regardless of my political perspective, uh, from a historical perspective, I would certainly rank FDR in the top five. Yeah, I think he obviously made an impact. One of the only presidents to serve uh, four terms. I think the only, obviously. And only. The, the only. only president dealing with some crisis there at that time and very left. I mean, is he the most left president? I know we've talked about it before, maybe a discussion for a podcast. Uh, yeah. The market opened up here this morning looking like it potentially could be breaking out, Matt. There was positivity out of the U.S.-China trade negotiation and the talks there. They pushed a date out to March 27th saying that, hey, we've got until then to get a new deal done. And it looked like they were going to do that. The market all morning long, though, has been selling. What's your read technically? Well, technically speaking, it, it did not break out. I know it got above 2,800, but we've talked about this, guys. It is a zone around that 2,800. It's not if it closes at 2,801. You know, I saw this headline, uh, market closes above 2,800, and all of a sudden the bulls are just supposed to run. No, support and resistance is not a finite number. It is a zone. And that zone we talked about, and, you know, Coach Noah was on last week, and we talked about that zone being somewhere around 2,820 to 2,825. And market gaps up uh, today or excuse me, market gaps up last night on positive news coming out of the Chinese-U.S. trade war. And then it just kind of flat lines. But then you had an economic report right here come out, Tim, and the market's kind of flat on the overnight here. Economic report came out right here. And let me get, this, uh, let me get the actual numbers accurate. Construction spending, Tim, was reported at 8.30, p 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, construction spending was supposed to come in at a positive 0.2% increase, but it had a really big miss, 0.6% uh, decrease in construction spending. We will get more housing data as the, as the week goes on with new home sales and existing home sales. But that was a negative to the market and gave the market, I think, a little bit of uh, a little bit of reason to lock in profit, and 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 that's what I kind of see here. I don't see this as a major catalyst at that point. We've also talked about the intraday levels of support and resistance, and as you can see, those intraday levels at 2780. That's kind of right where the market is right there, and then you have that lower end right here at about 2765, where you have intraday support right there as well as intraday resistance. So, I it, this market, even with the sell off that it's having today, Tim, it's it's still within the range that we've talked about in the halftime report over the course of the last couple of weeks. And so, it, it, and, and quite frankly, Tim, I would celebrate a deeper retracement. I think this market needs a deeper retracement to really kind of reset and start running into resistance again. And, and, and the last thing I'll say about the 1% the bear market here, guys, 
is after a, a, a marketplace that has went from 2350 to 2800, literally 450 points up over the course of the last month and a half to two months, a 1% pullback, for, 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 for the bulls out there in the market today, take a step back, take mm-hmm. a deep breath. It is a 1% pullback after an 18% run up. Come on, what are we doing? You know, over a percent sell off here today, but intraday we're a little bit more. We're at 1.17 on the S&P, Dow's at 1.4, NASDAQ at 1.2. Mark, I got to bring you in here on this one before we go too far past the S&P. This is a bigger red candle. Now, I do know we need, and we all talked about this in the pre-production show, and I think we're all of the same mind. We need a a good, healthy market that goes up and down. We can't go up straight up every single day. Mark, is there a risk that this could spin into something more than that right now? What are you seeing? I mean, anytime you have short-term price movement, a short-term price movement can be anywhere from a few hours to a few days. Uh, you, you never know where the bottom of that short-term price movement is. That's why it's important to look at interday levels that form. And if those interday levels form and then break, then you're going to see another leg down. I mean, that's just going to happen. So if you see a little support level form on a 15 or 30 minute chart, whatever your preference is, and then that breaks, you can see a leg down. I mean, you just highlighted that multi-day support area that's formed over the last couple of weeks. And if that doesn't hold, I mean, you're going to see another leg down. So it depends on what your time frame is. Anyone that entered a bullish trade this morning obviously isn't very happy right now. But you have to ask yourself, you know, right now you have a lot of market participants such as myself that have been sitting out the last couple of weeks waiting for, something to really happen, knowing that there's been a lot of overbought conditions, not liking this resistance zone that Matt was talking about. So you've had a lot of people sitting out. I am not bearish on the market. I have just been hesitant. And I think there's a lot of people like me. But if you want to, if you, if you want to see where this market goes, that support zone, you're just highlighting that multi-day short-term support level is going to be key. If it breaks, you could see another leg down. That doesn't mean that the market's going to turn ultra bearish. I mean, I, October, November, December aren't so far in our memories that it doesn't freak traders out. I know, sure. but can we can we not call bullish retracements bearish? I, I, <laughs> I, I, I could not agree more. It's just like I've been waiting, for example, pull up Boeing. I've been waiting to get into Boeing for a longer term position, not a short term swing trade, but I haven't been able to because it's just there hasn't been a pullback. Mm-hmm. There hasn't been a pullback. Hey, all, all I'm going to say about Boeing is this. Hey, halftime crew, how many times did I say Boeing 440? Every if day. You, if you weren't trailing up the stop loss on this small candle at Target 440, you made a mistake. If you didn't trail up a stop loss on a gap up above a Target on an overextended stock and then a profit takes during the day and you didn't trail up stop loss or lock in profit, you made a mistake. Mm-hmm. You can't look at this candle and say, oh, the market's ripped. <laughs> Are you kidding me? The market gave you three days for the for you to take action here on the marketplace. And so now Boeing is in a nice little bullish retracement. And most likely we're going to see a little bit of a pullback in Boeing. And it's going to give us an opportunity to reset. That's what is going to happen. It's going to give us an opportunity to reset the trade and make another trade. And that is a very, very good thing. That's a great thing, actually. Markets have to do that or we don't get triggers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, Boeing was that. I, just, I have to comment on one thing. Like when I when I started off and I was looking at my market headlines this morning, I saw U.S. stocks hope open higher amid hopes for U.S.-China trade deal. And I literally yelled at my computer. I'm like, how many times? The market's like a crack addict that is now immune to the China trade hope drug. It, it, it needs another fix. You can't recycle that headline for four straight weeks, for three straight months, and have that just be like, all right, let's just keep going higher and higher on the same headline. Well, it's it's become it's become a buy the rumor, sell the news. The rumor kept being that the deal is going to happen, the deal is going to happen, the deal is going to happen. It just kept going up and up and up and up. And then Guys, now, you- I, I'm telling you right now, China, China, and the U.S. trade deals baked in. It, it, those, it's those like trade deals are already in the chart. Huey Lewis in the news said it best. I need a new drug. 
The market needs a new storyline to drive this higher. Gary Lewis of the Lewis drop on the on the. You know, <laughs> I need a new drug because that China trade deal is worn off. We've already got our fix on it. As Matt said, it's baked in. Give us something new. And what I mean, I mean, this is what I've been saying for two weeks. Where is that new storyline? Where is that new catalyst coming from? Because it's not going to be from low valuations. It's not going to be because from economic data. What is it that's going to push it higher? Maybe it will come from the power of love, right? <laughs> Did you just look that up? You just took 30 <laughs> seconds to look that up. I know, uh, I, I you know don't you, get a Huey Lewis reference all that often. I, I you, you don't, you don't. But I will tell you, I did like Huey Lewis and the news back. Uh, Huey Lewis and the news back in the day. It was, it was great. But looking at looking at the market right now, guys, where could that next catalyst come from? Let's list out a couple things. Uh, you do have the unemployment report coming out this week, and, and that's a big one. That's a big one. That's a big one, and that certainly could be a catalyst. But Mark, I, we, you and I have talked about this. That could be a good economic report where the market actually takes a bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about if this market continues to go up, guys, Powell's going to start talking about interest rates again. That's that's what's going to happen. And so, in, in my estimation, there and, and I said this a couple months ago. I'm going to reiterate it. There's there there certainly could be a Powell call and a Powell put here. Yeah. where he, he has sold calls to keep the market from the top and he has sold puts to keep the market from the bottom. And I've said this for, for a little bit too, that, you know, best case scenario, Tim, and we've talked about this many times, best case scenario, market goes sideways to allow the Fed to do what they need to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, so, and so, you know, it, as the market continues to go up and up and up, you're going to start hearing headlines, oh, is the Fed going to raise rates? Fed going to raise rates? Because the U.S. economy has done really good, guys. The U.S. economy is still churning and burning out there. And so, in, <laughs> I like Justin, uh, the Pal Condor. Yep, yep, that's what it is. It's the Pal Condor. I like that. The Short Pal string, Condor. The Pal Condor. I like that. But, I like but that a lot, actually. Everything that, that Pal is doing has nothing to do with the U.S., has everything to do with Europe and China. And mm -hmm. we've seen negative data come out of Europe. We've seen negative data coming out of China. So positive news coming out of the U.S., but negative news coming out of uh, the, the Europe and China, that's going to keep the market in a mixed posture, which is going to still be this stock picker's market. And, and from a trader's perspective, I like stock picker's market. I, I don't do like markets that – just go up or just go down. I want a trending environment to give the technical traders the things that they need to do mm -hmm. to go out there and run their business. And so, you know, with the market doing what it's done over the last week and a half, two weeks, you're still in that range between 2820 and 2770 until it breaks there. I don't think anybody should be doing anything that aggressively outside of individual positions. We have to see this market break out for you to get aggressive. And I don't know how many times we have to say that, Tim. If well, I have to say that, that every day until it breaks out. I'll say that every day because you should not be aggressive, bullish or bearish right now. Not when the market has not picked a direction and it's still in that type of consolidation high base pattern. Mm -hmm. You're seeing a decoupling. There's no question about it. I mean, you take individual names like United Health. You know, the healthcare plan companies have all been uh, getting it on the chin lately, Matt. They've been dropping. That space has gone bearish. But don't then pick that. Don't don't pick up that falling knife. That's not done. Know. Not done yet. I mean, you're down 4% here today in the entire space. Cigna, CVS, all of them, they're all dropping. Uh, yeah. But then you look at like home builders, you know, uh, Toll Brothers, for example, or Pulte Home, which we had that construction number, but they're all on, a, all on a beautiful bullish retracement pattern. You have individual areas of the market which are developing in different ways which is good for us as traders because then we can pick what we like. You know, We can mm -hmm. look for patterns that fit our overall posture, our, our strategy and our design and then trade that way. Oh, was that a question? I thought that no, was a statement. Sta statement. Usually when I leave a statement there long enough, uh, somebody will pop in. Uh, but let's move on from the S&P. <laughs> there you go. I love it. All right. Uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average here, Matt, uh, in my opinion, was the strongest of all the indexes for a while. Big red candle at the top hitting resistance. Same price action as the S&P. I don't really see any discernible difference here today. They're both falling off a cliff intraday. Maybe a break below support here. Is there is there a difference, Matt, between those there, two? There, there is a difference. The difference is you are breaking interday support levels on the Dow, uh, on the Dow Jones. A lot of this led by Boeing's profit taking. <clears throat> I don't see a lot of a lot of economics here, guys. That that miss on on the um, uh, the construction spending was it, it was a big miss, but that is not a major economic report. 
Yeah. That that it was a reason to lock in profit. Now you're sitting on a rising 20 day moving average. Let's see how the market responds to that. You know, here on the uptrend with the Dow, I mean, I'm seeing different uh, action across the board. I know we've been watching major names like Apple Computer, who's a Dow component, also on the NASDAQ. Apple tried to break out today, Matt, and uh, it's one I have on my list. Everybody does. Uh, when you get that kind of action up here at 175, it fails. And you've talked about confirmation so many different times, but I don't think you can talk about it too much. How do you approach this? I mean, because it was really strong this morning. For about a half an hour, hour, it was above resistance. Does it have to close above that level for you to be confident? For me, yes, it, it does. Given the fact that the market has not broken out and it's not broken out of that 2800 to 2820 resistance level, yes, I have to see closes, guys. You know, so when, when you're looking at those scatter reports, and I talked about this last Wednesday in the swing trading webinar, when you're looking at those scatter reports, yes, you can trigger above that level. That That is an aggressive trigger, and there's nothing wrong with having an aggressive trigger going into that trade. <laughs> mm -hmm. However, however, if it, 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 when the market's doing what it's doing, the conservative approach is to wait for the market to close above those numbers. And, and in this market condition right now, I think it is important for confirmation, Tim. I do mm -hmm. think that is important. So you gotta know who you are as a trader, number one. If you're an aggressive trader and you wanna trigger above the breakout channel on the breakout, you could go into that full knowing that you could get faked out here. And, and especially in this market condition where remember last Monday, guys, last Monday, market gaps up a little bit, sells off intraday. This Monday, market gaps up a little bit, doesn't break out, sells off intraday. So, so again, fool me once, fool me, uh, fool me twice type scenarios here, Tim. Yes, I have to see confirmation on breakouts right now. Mm -hmm. Mark, as you're looking at the Dow and the S&P, does one look any discernibly stronger or weaker to you than the you other? Know, I, I think there's an advanced technique. Now, remember on the run up. Now, let's look. Let's talk about this from a sector level. Different sectors had different levels of resistance. And you saw some sectors breaking resistance levels on the way up, which were followed by everything breaking resistance levels on the way up. When you see certain areas of the market or certain broad market gauges break resistance, or in this case, break short-term support before others, I think it is a telling sign about the overall strength of the market one direction or another. So while the S&P hasn't broken that short-term support, the fact that some market gauges have, I think is very telling. Mm -hmm. You know, I do like to do bottom up analysis to really understand what's going on with a, a space. And uh, Matt, I'm looking at these charts individually, and I see a lot more weakness than even the broad chart does. Uh, you look at McDonald's real quick, MCD. We're going to rapid fire through a few. Oh, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry, Tim. I was just looking at a headline in the market. And I want to get you guys to take very quickly on this headline. Yeah. Then we'll look at McDonald's. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. Reuters, you're better than this. Uh, S&P falls below 2,800 as trade optimism fades. What do you guys think of that headline? You're going to make it up as they Oh, <laughs> my God almighty. If you listen to CNBC or Reuters or oh, Bloomberg Lord. for your market analysis, you are destined to be one of the <laughs> lemmings in society yeah, that late, simply is at the mercy of stupidity oh. guiding stupidity. So, Reuters, so let, me, let me get this straight. Let me get this straight really quickly. Markets go up overnight on Sunday night because of trade optimism. An imminent deal in place, right? And specifically, China agrees to buy more of our farm, chemical, auto, and other industrial parts for us, giving uh, uh, re uh, basically removing the trade tariffs we placed in 2018. But the markets go up on that, but then it goes down on trade. Come on. It was an economic report right here, guys. Listen. And even more than that, the mainstream financial media has to create causality with their headlines. The market has to be acting rationally according to set parameters at all time. What you never hear these mainstream financial media outlets do is say, hey, there's a nice technical sell-off going on right now. They, An intraday never, support level got broken on the down. No, and they didn't they, because that yeah. does not fit their narrative. And so they have to attribute causality. So they'll say once – this is hilarious. This is like a textbook case of, hey, it was the trade war sending it up, but now it's the trade war sending it down. Oh, but 
guys, we're talking about a difference in not even 12 hours. I know. I, it's I, hilarious, but they have to assign causality because so, they have to make okay. the general populace so, think that the market is rationally. Let me get this right. Let me get this right. So plunge protection team here, Fed mm -hmm. here, Fed right here, and all of this the last month has been positive Chinese deal. But the one day we see a 1% sell-off after a positive headline on Sunday night that gapped it open, all of a sudden the headline is trade war worries. Hmm. My God, lazy, 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 lazy. No analysis whatsoever. That It's just it's just funny, Tim. I, I just saw that headline, T, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. So McDonald's. No, no, no. I went and looked at it. And Matt, literally, literally, write this down. We cannot forget because this is this that's hilarious. Within 12 hours, opposite headlines to attribute price action to. Oh, by the way, Reuters had a positive headline earlier today that the market was going up on positive news. Everybody did. Market Watch, Reuters, and, uh, everybody three did. Three hours later, three hours later after a negative economic report, it's markets going down on 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 trade concerns. It, it just my God, why does anybody watch? Why, why like does that? technical analysis scare people? I do. I, I don't know. Like, why can't scary. they acknowledge its existence? You, when you say people, do you mean like academics? Uh, news, no, like uh, I think most people like it, to think that the market would actually be driven by technical things. I think uh -huh. it scares people. Well, the academics and the economists don't want to believe that because then it discredits a lot of the work they did to get their degree and all that kind of stuff. It discredits you know, their entire life, Tim. I get that. Um, because they probably can't read it, Mark, or maybe they don't know how to interpret it. Uh, there's a lot of different parties to that. I don't think it scares well, traders. I've always, you know? I've always thought it's uh, people who failed at trading, so they justify their own opinion because they failed at something else. Sure, yeah. By the way, John Keynes? Yeah. The famed economist who now is responsible for the entire debt cycle in the entire world was a horrible trader. A horrible <laughs> trader. Yes, he was. He was a terrible trader. I'm seeing he was, he was he was buying stock in 1929 after he f failed to buy anything in the 1920s. He laid into everything in 1929, got absolutely crushed, and then 1932 he goes to FDR and is like, "Hey, listen, we got to pump free money into everybody." Mm -hmm. Yeah, John Keynes, thumbs up. Good job, buddy. You know, Matt, I'm looking at all these different Dow components, and we don't have to go through all of them. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But I am seeing some companies that are showing me discernible weakness. Uh, McDonald's, Boeing, United Health, they're all down 3%, Matt, uh, and uh, really selling on very, very big candles. Walgreens, Verizon, even Nike is fading at the top here. It could be a little bit more when you look at the individual components. I know it's only one candle, one data point. Do you ever, uh, when, you, when you're looking through these companies, Matt, does that give you more caution than the broad index on the Dow? No, I'm not, I'm not seeing Boeing as a trend reversal here. And I'm, I, you know, Nike at this point is a failed breakout, but I'm not seeing it as a trend reversal. So I, I, I'm not taking this as anything other than profit taking, Tim, yeah. at, at this point. And I'll tell you why. A couple of reasons. Number one, look at volume so far today mm -hmm. on Nike. We don't have an increase on volume today, not so far. You're you're going to see you're going to see more volume come in, but you're not seeing massive selling from the masses here. Sure. You're not seeing people come in and be like, "Oh, I hate Colin Kaepernick, let's short Nike," right? Sure. You're, you're you're not seeing anything like that. You're seeing people who have made money in this trend get a negative headline, and they lock in profit. That's mm -hmm. what you're seeing today. Boeing. Don't get me started on Boeing because I, I won't stop. If people complain about Boeing today, I, they, they, I, I won't stop. If people say one negative word about Boeing coming down 2.8% after a 35% run up, I, I, no, you're not a trader. No, get out of here. Go. Because that is, that is just ignorance is what it is. This is profit taking is what we're seeing at this point. We have not broken intraday support level, guys. We have not even started forming a bullish retracement. We are still sitting within an intraday uh, intraday level that has been consistent for the last week and a half. So so I'm not going to freak out over Boeing being down 2.87% today. I'm not going to freak out over you know Nike and McDonald's. Nobody should be trading McDonald's. It's been in a neutral formation. Yeah. Move have on we even seen that McDonald's chart yet? I've been trading while we've been looking see whenever you talk mcdonald's the increases in me getting a big mac go up about four thousand percent 
But yeah, I mean, it's trading within a range. Whenever you're going to have I, this, I think they have bacon on their Big Mac right now, Mark. I haven't tried that is it. That's the big promotion. Yeah. Promotion. I haven't tried it. And when the freaking F mother at, is the McRib coming back? <laughs> never. I have been wanting it's a McRib for six It's not real days. food. Like the it's, McRib. It's not real rib. It's not <laughs> real meat, Mark. It's terrible. Hey, listen, as a McDonald's <laughs> connoisseur, I don't. I know all of this. I don't care. Get a salad. Don't eat a McRib. Get out. I of know here. what the hot dog is <laughs> made. Last time you ate a salad, buddy. I need a salad. All right. So I don't need. I want the days. McRib back. First of all, out okay. of all the things you can get at McDonald's, the idea of going there and getting a McRib, I just don't follow that. There's a lot of great things. People yeah. like, listen. McDonald's lovers love the McRib. They love eating that process. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you <laughs> elitist. Doesn't want to say it. Don't say it. Don't, say it. don't say it. Don't just leave it alone. Socialistic. <laughs> Because Bernie we don't like Sanders McRib. loving <laughs> McRib hating, you are not an American. That is not American. You don't like the McRib sandwich. It's not American. Mark's right. hot take of the day. Got it. Well, um, I guess I'm not American then. Yeah. yeah. I do not. Yeah, I don't, I don't, nope. I don't no, like McRib. I'm not on the McRib. Let's ask the, oh, the halftime crew. Let's have to ask the halftime crew. The yes McRib. No. Are you in on the McRib? I'm a no. I'm a no. I, I have a hard time. yes. I had it one time. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is what people are talking about. I wouldn't feed that right. to my dogs. Cody, are you're you from Texas. Me? What are you oh, doing? Oh yeah, I'm not. A, I'm not a fan of the big group. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Y'all are a bunch. You just garbage, don't get... garbage, garbage. So, so based on our preliminary study and research of not liking the McRib, obviously McDonald's is down today. This is how good of a headline is. This is this is as accurate of a headline as what Reuters just put up. <laughs> That's funny, today. actually. <laughs> McDonald's down today because tackle trading does not like the McRib sandwich. That if you didn't think what that Matt just said was hilarious, then uh, that was maybe the funniest thing I've heard Matt say all year. That was well, funny. Thank you. I yeah. loved it. NASDAQ 100, uh, I guess more like internal chuckle type funny, not uh, laugh out loud. I liked funny. it. I thought it was good. Tim, you, need to work, <laughs> you, need to work on, you need to work on your humor, buddy. <laughs> I, I don't ever make Mark laugh. He, don't, uh, don't, don't try to bring me down. Mark pumps me it's, up. It's fair enough. Very true. Uh, the NASDAQ here obviously is holding up at 0.8%. Not exactly as weak as the others, Matt. We get a little green candle on the bottom. There's going to be some tech stocks I'm interested here on this sell-off. There's no doubt about it. The number one that is grabbing my attention today is Salesforce.com because yeah. of their earnings, because of the sell-off. I've been wanting this company to come back anyway. Not going to catch a falling knife on this candlestick, but now definitely watch list and move it right up the watch list to, to start paying attention. Matt, what would you want to see from here? It could even be days or weeks to develop, but what would you want to see for here, from here for Salesforce? I would like to see a neutra, uh, neutral formation form between 155 and 165. I want to see uh, 155 hold on the intraday. I know that's really kind of more like 156, but I'm, I'm putting it in the 155 ball range. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, you're not touching self, Salesforce over the next few days. Um, first and foremost, let's look at their actual earnings numbers. This is a company that we at Tackle really, really like. Uh, earnings per shares came in at 61 cents a share versus the expectation of 50 cents. And uh, uh, revenue came in line at 3.4 billion versus the expectation of 3.4 billion. Year over year, 26.6% increase in revenue. And uh, guidance was a little mixed, Tim. Guidance was a little mixed, but it was relatively in line. Once again, I'm taking this more as profit taking after a very, very good run over the course of the last couple months. Yeah, and it is making all of the stocks in their space kind of move together here, Matt. I'm looking at Adobe. I'm looking at uh, Oracle, Intuit, Red Hat. Uh, they're all down right now. In fact, Adobe, ADBE, is down 3.6% as well. Non-earnings related, when one company like Salesforce moves, I mean, it really can move the entire sector. Mark had a good point about it being industry-specific or even ETF-based. What you read on Adobe? Uh, it, it, itself, Salesforce obviously had an impact on not only its industry, but stocks that have some degree of consistency with Salesforce. It wasn't just Salesforce. It's stocks that also had some degree of business with Salesforce and Adobe getting getting hit, you know, hit underneath that 20, uh, 260. But not only did it fail the breakout here at 263, Tim, it broke underneath the resistance level that was historic at 260. It also broke the, uh, the, the retracement level right here at about 256 by 255. Obviously, any trader that was buying the breakout or the retracement got stopped out, and that's unfortunate. But 
these things happen, guys. These things are a normal market condition. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not happy that, that, you know, we failed the breakout here. That's not something I want to see. But I also do want to see a normal market condition. And a lot of times, the, uh, what, this is a normal market condition where you have a major, major player like Salesforce announce earnings. It's going to have an impact on the other stocks within that sector, within that industry. And you saw that with Adobe. You saw that with Team. You saw that with uh, with uh, VM Software. You saw that across the board with these types of stocks all doing very, very similar to what Salesforce is doing today. And whether you're trading VMware, which which nobody should have been trading because earnings was last Friday, but whether you're trading any one of these stocks, you've got to let them set up. And so what I would do if I was anybody trading this area of the, of, of the market, and people do love their tech stocks, I would shy away from Salesforce right now. I'd shy away from Team. I'd shy away from VM. I'd shy away from Adobe. I'd shy away from that from an active trading perspective. Investing is a little different, but from an active trading perspective, I think you got to wait to see trends develop again because this is a nasty, nasty movement in Adobe. And it's not the 3% down because you look at Boeing, Tim. My analysis on Boeing is not stay away. My analysis on Boeing is let it set up again right? Let it form that retracement, whether it slows down around 420 or whether we come down to the pivot point here at about 412. I don't know where that support level is going to form between, it could be anywhere between 420 and really kind of 400. I don't know where that's going to form, but I am looking for a trade when that does form. So Adobe's down, uh, Boeing's down 3%, but I'm, I'm looking at this saying, okay, that, that good, 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 good. Let the trade set up so I can target 480 next time. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Adobe or or whatnot, you get a similar three percent downward. But there's a difference in the three percent on Boeing versus the three percent on Adobe. With Adobe, <clears throat> with Adobe, you broke. 262, which was an interday support level. You broke 260, which was an interday support level. You broke a very important uh, daily support level between two, 256 and 257. You broke three different important levels of support here on Adobe. You got to stay away from that. Mm -hmm. Most likely, you're going to start forming some type of neutrality or bearish downtrend on Adobe versus a Boeing. I'm saying, thank goodness we got a 3% down day on Boeing. That's just going to quicken my ability to trade Boeing again. Sure. You know, uh, coming back to the NASDAQ for a minute here, also with Adobe and all of these other companies selling, I'm seeing relative strength out of some of the bigger names, though. Uh, Amazon is up today. Apple is flat today about failing on a breakout. Facebook is up today as well on no discernible news. In fact, I was going through the Facebook news, Matt, and I saw mostly negative headlines. You know, they rejected their ab the ability for consumers of their product to restrict searches on them. Uh, they actually were lobbying some internal con congressmen about uh, changing some of the privacy laws and the way that they've so, been hard so on. So they're, they're the devil. It, it's uh, see, I, you they're say the negative devil. headlines. Yes, I see a company I believe in. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you, you call them the devil and Mark's yeah, like, you, you, well, you, know you attributed make, yeah. <laughs> they know how to make money. You okay. lose consumer confidence, Mark, and people stop using but your hold on, hold on. Nobody's hold stopping on, using hold Facebook. On. Hold on. We've seen negative headlines on Facebooks for two years now. OK, ever since the ever since the 2016 election, that Facebook was implicit in. So in terms of Facebook, have we seen consumers leave Facebook? What have their subscriptions they're, numbers done? They're, they're still off. looking at they're still looking at cat pictures. They're still arguing about politics on Facebook. They're still forming their Facebook groups. They're still doing that. Mm -hmm. But consumers and, and this it, people this are still stalking their exes on Facebook. Mark, you do Facebook not have is to never going away. As 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 your Catholic priest, you don't have to admit to things live in the halftime report. But in 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 terms of Facebook, Tim. I agree with you that I am concerned about Facebook. I don't use Facebook nearly as much as I used to because of privacy concerns. But my generation and the older generations that, that concern themselves with privacy is not shared with the younger generations. You have my, my, my our children's generation. You have the millennial generation. They're, they're growing up in an environment of the Internet era where it's just common common practice to break privacy. So so I'm not too concerned about Facebook's negative headlines because we've seen those negative headlines. What and and from a trading perspective, that's what I'm focused on on Facebook and sometimes this happens 
when you get a good retracement coming into 160, yeah, we want that V-shaped recovery coming back up. But now you're just seeing this flat line. And for all the traders out there, they're like, go up, go up, go up, go up. No, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to form. What I'm very, very interested on Facebook here is this 160 support level has been tested multiple different times, has not had the ability to break it, which means I still like my trade on Facebook. I don't care from, from a trader perspective. I understand that there's always going to be positive and negative, but I'm going to focus on the price action. 160 is holding on Facebook, and until 160, until 160 is broken, I like my trade on Facebook. You know, what's interesting about this price action, if, you, if I would have told you on any random day, Facebook and Amazon are up, you would have assumed the market would be up. Okay. I mean, those two companies alone, based on market cap in the NASDAQ, it's an yeah, enormous amount of exposure. That's been over for four months, though. They're decoupling. I mean, yeah. I, and could it be, you guys asked a question earlier, I'll throw this out there, kind of play devil's advocate. Could the, the reason why the market runs is that you get leadership out of Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, Netflix, and Microsoft again, and we finally come back with tech and start running on that? I don't or, think or maybe Or maybe it runs because Boeing's so damn good. <laughs> I think the days of Fang leading the market are over. Yeah, I, I, I think that Fang trade, if you guys remember that Fang trade was started by Jim Cramer, like, what, mm -hmm. five years ago? Yeah. Right? About five years ago when he put Facebook, Apple, Netflix, and, and Google into the Fang. Um, Amazon later on came into the Fang. And, and so, yeah, I mean, but that's not this market condition. That led to a lot of overvaluations in those stocks. We're looking at a different market environment right now. You know, while we're talking tech, we do have to talk Tesla here uh, for a bit. TSLA, they announced that they're going to release some kind of SUV. It is selling here, Matt. If that breaks below is it the Model Y, is Model it? Y SUV. Is Model Y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, all I'm going to say about that is apparently Elon Musk needs a bunch of cash injections. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> hey, listen, it is the most hotly debated company in the market, and that's not me saying that. I mean, I, I'm not going to debate it anymore. The numbers, the numbers tell the truth. It's well, not, no, it's, it's not. not. Every smart person hates it. I'm not. Every it, dumb it's person not, it's not debatable. likes it. It's not debatable. I, I will say that w we have debated it many and there is a lot of short interest in the market, but there are also people that will come in and buy no matter what. Here's a question I got that we could discuss. If it breaks below 280, is that shortable? All yes. the way down to 250. I'm not doing it. But it is. I mean, that's it a is. signal and a trigger. You have weakness here. You're down three and a half percent. You've got strong volume as well, Matt. The last two days, we've had a pickup in volume as this selling pressure has run. Yeah. Because nobody has liked anything Elon has said over the last four days. <laughs> I did like his Elon touch. I, I mean, my God, how many times do we have to see it? When he came out with the Model S and he said, okay, you just had to put $1,000 down and you, you, you'll get your car in five years from now, right? You got, what, what, do I need to teach what a damn Ponzi scheme is? Do I really need to teach that? When you need to get cash injections just to pay your bills, that's called a Ponzi scheme. And, I, and I, I'm not calling Tesla a Ponzi scheme. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they need cash injections to run their business. That's what they need. Tim, they also just had to pay out $780 million in a bond literally today because their price was under 350. They had to pay it down in cash. They need cash injections. And if you ask me to invest in a company that needs cash injections just to, just to, just to put their business profitable, mm -hmm. not, pro no, excuse me, not profitable, but to keep the doors open. I'm not even going to say to keep the doors open because now they don't sell cars to people that walk into a store. Mm -hmm. They're going to sell cars online. They're changing them. Whatever. I, I just don't. I mean, listen, you can trade anything. I might place a bullish trade on Tesla at some point this year. I, I just cannot see out of all of the thousands of choices in the market why you would choose Tesla as the one to invest in. Yeah. Trading doesn't matter. We can make money up. We can make money down. That's a whole different ball of wax. Mark, but you were telling a story in the pre-production show on a woman you were dating out of Seattle. <laughs> Right. That so I was you, what? That you were dating some woman. I'm or, not dating anyone. I flirt. <laughs> okay. You were, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I, I have been a married man for a long time. I don't know the difference between flirting and dating. I so, flirt. Okay. Like, so I haven't flirting. dated anyone since my divorce. I flirted quite a bit. Okay. <laughs> Semantics there, brother. Okay. But uh, tell the story about this, Tessa, because I think it's really, really important. All right. So I'm flirting with this woman from Seattle and uh, we're talking stocks for about 30 minutes, which of course for me is like, you know, dirty talk at, you know, one o'clock in the morning, you know, you're talking the stock market might as well have been X-rated talk for me. I loved it. And, she, you know, she's like, well, tell me what you think about some of the stocks in my portfolio. 
And I'm like, I'll give you my opinion. And she's like, I own 2,000 shares of Tesla. I immediately spit out the drink that I was drinking and had to put my hand over the phone because I'm like, oh, why in the world would anyone own two? I, 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 I was like this. Wait, wait, Mark, what did I say, though, when you said that? And Matt, I, when I'm telling I, Matt the story, the first thing, and Matt said, well, how big is her portfolio? Because 2,000 st- shares equates to you know, a little less than 600,000. And, and he's like, well, if she has a $6 million portfolio, then it's that would be about 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, then whatever. Yeah. you know, It's a little high for my taste for any individual, but, like, but her portfolio was only about 1.2. So Tesla represented about half of her portfolio. Which, oh my God. <laughs> Which, oh first God. of all, okay, once again, like investing 101. Now, I'm a believer that you can have higher, like a lot of people will say two, four, five percent. Like if you love a company and want to go higher than that as a total percent because you got it at a value rate and loaded up, hey, I'm a fan of that. I really am. But to have 50% of your portfolio in one stock is just fiduciarily irresponsible Mm -hmm. to yourself. Like you are putting your entire portfolio at the risk of one company. And that's just insane. And, and for me to have that one company be Tesla, oh, be, be the one company that like <laughs> we're out on. And right. I was like, I was like, well, what do you think of Elon Musk? She immediately says, well, I think he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay, okay. And I was like, hey, this woman has a PhD. This woman is a doctor. This woman is a very bright individual in her education. But but isn't it amazing how bright you can be in certain areas and still? Yes. I was like, all right. So let me walk you through this because you know, whenever I'm talking to an individual about their portfolio, I'm very very careful. I want them to come to their own conclusions. I'm like, all right. So you have about half of your portfolio. And the leader of the company in which you have half of that portfolio, you just described as crazy. (laughs) I was like, now think about that. And she's like, she she obviously has not read the intelligent investor. And she had one of those. Oh, huh. Let her know that the M in can slim is management. Listen, (laughs) I I was, listen, I was, I, I don't want to say debating. I was negotiating with an SEC attorney one time. And he made the statement. He said, Matt, who are you to tell people what position size to put on? Well, I could put on a 50% position size and I'd be just fine. I said, listen, don't take my word for it. That's what Warren Buffett said. Warren Buffett says you're an idiot. I didn't say you're an idiot. And this is what I said literally to the SEC attorney. I didn't say you're an idiot. Warren Buffett said you're an idiot. He's the one who said you want 20 to 30 positions in a portfolio. So if you want to go put in 50% of your portfolio in any stock you want to do, you have everybody's blessing to do whatever you want to do. But that doesn't mean it's right. What it means is it's foolish. And yes, I did call the SEC attorney. Well, it's gambling 101. I mean, it's like you, you're you always I – mean, I mean, this is one of the things that I loved about transitioning from the world of gambling to the stock market is risk management's the same is you don't just, you don't want to put yourself in a situation that you're gambling and putting that high a percentage in any individual company, you are letting the winds of chance potentially hurt you. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's just in, in my opinion, irresponsible. And guess what? I have a lot of company. Matt has a lot of company. Tim has a lot of company with that opinion. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that have preceded us that have done very well in the market. Yeah. have that opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, RTY, Matt, let's keep working through our uh, checklist here and let's uh, get into the dollar and crude oil as well. The Russell's looking like the rest of the market, hitting its head, red candle, pulling back, nothing quite. Is there anything different here that you're seeing no. in terms of strength, weakness? No, same. Same re- same re- as the Dow. Move on to the dollar then. Uh, let's talk about the dollar index. Trump said he wanted a weaker dollar. Now, first of all, that's interesting to me. He wants crude oil to go down and the there. dollar to go down. What's Come he on. talking it's, about here? It, nothing. He's not talking about anything. He, he wants, it, I'm not even going to debate this because it doesn't make economic sense. Trump wants a stronger dollar when it's politically appropriate. He wants a weaker dollar when it's politically appropriate. He wants to place all blame somewhere else. I'm not going to debate what Trump says or does anymore. In terms of the dollar here, 
I said this on Friday. You give me a close above 96.50, I'm slightly bullish on the dollar. We got that close above 96.50, and we saw price appreciation coming out of that. So, so I, to me, we're back to being slightly bullish on the dollar. And and but but this is a really really tough trading environment for uh, for the dollar this week. Extremely tough trading environment for the dollar. Not only do you have major economic reports out there, but you also have major central bank announcements coming out this week as well, Tim. And that's obviously going to have an impact on the entire currency. On Monday night, you have the Australian dollar. On, when, uh, on Wednesday, you have the Canadian dollar. On Thursday, you have the euro. Those three, those three central banks are not expected to raise interest rates in any capacity, but it is what they're going to say in their you know, their, their, their policy statements and speeches that we're kind of looking on. So I don't expect anybody to be raising rates this week. I don't expect anybody to be lowering interest rates this week, but I do expect a little choppy waters for the dollar. And for those currency traders, I would shy away from swing trading this week just simply because there's too many economic reports, but it's going to create a wonderful, wonderful day trading environment. And remember, when you're trading economic reports on the dollar, it's not about the initial reaction. It is that secondary re reaction that the traders want to really kind of focus on. You know, as I look across all the currency pairs here, the euro down, yen actually up. Safe haven currencies are looking like they've got a little action here today. Dollar, yen are both up here today. Uh, we've got that 27th date for a Brexit deadline, Matt. Uh, I don't know if we're going to make, make that or not. Theresa May really has an inspired confidence in me. I'll tell you that. I'll, I'll talk about it on the halftime report when I actually care about it. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on to crude oil and the energy space. As I look at crude oil flat on the day and wants to break out, actually was up this morning and selling now through the middle of the day. Crude oil, I actually saw data on Friday and Mark, I know you watched the rig count for the first time in nine months. I saw that the rig count dropped in the U.S. Could that be a It sign doesn't matter. No. What, what, what you have on the rig count and why it's becoming less of an indicator. And if you don't know what it is, I'm not going to bore you. We got limited time per rig. Because of technology and innovation, U.S. oil producers are able to produce more oil per rig. And so you can have a rig count stabilize or even go down a little bit, but total oil production still be going up because it's all about, I mean, that's just true in business. People become more productive. Companies become more productive. The longer this little range exists on oil, the more explosive the breakout or breakdown will be. Been trading sideways going into its third week, start of its third week, two straight weeks. Uh, the longer you trade sideways, when it finally does break one direction or another, it will be a really good day trade and potentially a really good swing trade as well, especially if there's a catalyst behind it. Really setting up for a really nice profitable opportunity one way or another, the longer it trades sideways here. Yeah. One thing that is breaking down right now as well are the industrial metals, silver and gold specifically, Matt. Uh, gold broke below $1,300 an ounce. I'm still bullish on the metal long term, but you have to respect the weakness in the short term sell off. What's your read? Oh, yeah. I, I said it Friday. You got to go back down to neutrality. Mm hmm. From, from a short-term trader's perspective, you got to go back down to neutrality. Uh, the gold sell-off, I, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, to be perfectly honest with you. I've read all the headlines. They don't make sense. Uh, I, I think the most likely scenario, we've debated this on, on the scanner report meeting on, on Friday for an extended period of time, really trying to dive into what was, what was impacting gold. And, you know, and, and one of the reasons why we spent so much time on the scanner report really kind of detailing that is because we've been all over gold since the very bottom in October of last year, Tim. And uh, this trend has really not changed. But but what what personally what I see and, and we took a radical change in the scan report from a, from a bullish position to a neutral position, which we usually don't do. But that is the that is the severity of that break of thirteen hundred. I, you're going back down in neutrality here. You got to keep your eye focused on 1280 as a support level, and you got to focus right back now at 1300 by 1310 as as a resistance level. But mm -hmm. I don't see any any new trading environment here for the foreseeable future, Uncle. And you know why there wasn't any? And I talked about it. If you're not a pro subscriber, I talked about this breakdown in gold last week in the commodities report this weekend. You know why you didn't see a headline? Because they weren't. I tried to scour all the headlines yeah. to see what causality. They weren't. They were confused. I don't because it was a technical huge sell-off. You break those interday support levels, and when there aren't really hard support levels to take hold, 
price just falls and falls. Fear takes all talk in length in the commodities report. If you're not a pro member, want to read about the price action on gold. I mean, to be honest, and I'm sorry, the best analysis on the gold sell-off at the end of last week came at tackle it, trading in the commodity. It was really good. It was really good. You know, mm -hmm. does that mean I'm fearful? Absolutely not. These technical sell-offs happen. Does it mean I added protection when some of those signals were generated? It did. Will I look to get in again to more gold? I'm very excited to do so. But once again, I got to see that stability, that reversal, because these short-term technical sell-offs can be really, really severe. It's well, like in software. Now, though, because here's my thing. I've been waiting to get a, a pullback on palladium, and maybe this industrial metal, metal sell-off will actually give me something. It that won't. It won't. <laughs> like, what is going on with it this won't. thing? It, 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 Tim, it was, it was. It was literally on Friday. It was after I looked at gold, I looked at palladium and I was thinking, okay, yeah, we should see a little bit of carry through with palladium, right? I mean, if you're seeing silver down big and you're seeing, uh, you're seeing gold down big, you know, finally, are we going to get that, that nice little bullish retracement on palladium that a lot of people have been waiting for? And I looked at it and I'm like, you're kidding me, a doji? <laughs> it's because the technical setups on palladium weren't ripe to have that sell-off. So when gold triggered, it can drag down other precious oh, I, metals. I, I get that, but that gold break was so severe. It should have carried through, but that's how strong palladium is. Palladium and that's is how, and that's so how big strong. the technical signals were gold. They were p piling in. Like these technical sell-offs where there isn't a real catalyst provide tremendous opportunity. You know, not the next day, not the next week, but like when I see some of those software companies sell off today, Oh my gosh, I smell I, I, I smell teen spirit and I smell opportunity to get into stocks like VMW and team stocks that I've been looking and waiting for a good pullback. So there's great opportunity. You know, it sucks yeah, if you entered a trade yesterday. I'll, I'll tell you, Mark, and, and you know, you, you take team, for example, here, you know, obviously recovering a little bit intraday. But you can't touch team until it gets back above its resistance channel unless you're doing some other advanced type of technical system that, mm -hmm. you know, most people don't understand. You can't touch this right now. You, you got to wait for it to reset up. When the you're the other situation you could wait is if it comes down and stabilizes on a support level, but that's two weeks out. Yeah, it, well, yeah. And, and that's all I wanted to clarify was when you're talking like that, Mark, you're not saying I'm picking the bottom here today. Oh, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. You're you waiting for it to reestablish, right? You, so, absolutely. And so, if you're looking to get into gold or a software stock, because these sell offs can last for a bit, I mean, they can last for a bit. Don't try to guess the bottom. Wait for some formation on the chart. And guess what? We'll be all over it here. Yeah, if those will. support levels form on Team VMW, any of the software on gold, We'll be all over and be like, hey, this might be a nice reversal opportunity. But don't I, try to guess the bottom. Because I don't trade Team or Adobe or, or VM, but I do trade CRM. And you're looking at a very similar type situation on CRM that you're looking at on those other stocks that you mentioned, Mark. And, and to me, it's, it's going to take a week, two weeks for it to reestablish and to give us those intraday support and resistance levels that we need to start looking at triggers. And maybe you get a breakout in, in a week and a half from now. But I, I'll tell you right now, CRM, it doesn't – the earnings report today that I read on CRM – I'm not going to remove it from my watch list. No, <laughs> That's I'm not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm, I'm looking yeah. for, I'm, I'm waiting for a trade. I'm just waiting. Pati Remember what I said, patience is a position. I got to tell you, I was very uh, shocked, not shocked, maybe surprised to see Chipotle Mexican Grill on the option report here this week, Matt. Uh, you're famous for your rants against it, but actually Listen. breaking out and very, very strong. I, I want to be very clear on this. I don't hate chipotle <laughs> i don't hate them that was a running joke when i made a comment over somebody buying an overvalued burrito company right mm -hmm. with a pe ratio of 600 at the time and then that just became this running joke i trade i, I i'd like trading crm i'll trade a bullish i'll trade a bearish crm uh, not crm i'm still thinking salesforce uh chipotle it's not goldman sachs or tesla to me 
mm-hmm. I, I mean, no, and and you got to like the breakout. So yeah, it uh, it got approval. You know, you know, unanimous approval from the uh, from the uh, coaches at tackle. I love it. it was one of the prettiest uh, setups I've seen all year. And listen, you might not like it, but to quote another Huey Lewis song, a lot of Chipotle fanatics they're stuck on you. They're stuck on this company. They Were you love it. in the heart of rock and roll for a lot the of heart people? Rock and rolls. Yeah. All and, right, and, all right. and I want you to pull up square just so I can quote another Huey Lewis song and say it's hip to be square. So, you know, I just want to do the like five pack of I, Huey Lewis. I think we know what is on Mark's uh, Spotify list right now. You know? <laughs> I like you. Actually, Mark doesn't do Spotify. <laughs> not, I, Mark, I do believe I know what's in Mark's CD player right now. <laughs> you know why I canceled my Spotify account and you I like listen to YouTube instead? Because YouTube's free, Spotify isn't. And then I calculated out, if I cancel my Spotify account, how much money will I have if I can grow that money at 20% over Spotify, a 30-year period? Free. Uh, They're free. That, not the good stuff. No, you, got, you got to get the premium. You got to get the – I gotta, mean, it's amazing. if you're willing to spend 10 bucks and that's a priority for you a month, it's a great service. I love the service. Highly recommend it. I'm just cheap. Matt, we got to do it every Monday. Rapid fire me through the sectors and talk about any strength or weakness that you're seeing in the Excels. Mm-hmm. And uh, first and foremost, before we get into the sectors, Tim, I do want to talk a little bit about. I like that pullback on Square, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too, a little bit. Um, but uh, I do want to talk about economics. Make sure everybody's prepared for the week economically here. So let's go pull up Forex Factory. A uh, couple things on Forex Factory, guys. Uh, number one, uh, we were talking about new home sales, construction spending. As you can see, we have a construction spending came out today, it came in at a negative 0.6. New home sales come out tomorrow. Expectation is 590K sold. Uh, building permits and housing starts coming out on Friday. And sometimes when you look at all these economic reports together, it looks like this, and it can be really, really overwhelming. So this filter button up here allows you to look at different types of uh, economic activity that does impact the market, but let's keep it on the full filter here. So on Tuesday, Tim, ISM non-manufacturing uh, PMI report is supposed to come out in the U.S. at 57.4. This is the same economic report that we are concerned about with China as they have showed two consecutive months of under recessionary levels under that uh, all important 50 barrier. Then later on on Wednesday, you start the unemployment report with ADP non formal employment change. And then that fi- uh, finishes up here on Friday with the actual unemployment rate uh, supposed to come in at 3.9% with an expectation one in 185K. This number is important, guys. We've had over 200,000 new jobs consistently for the, uh, for the uh, past little bit. So keep an eye on the unemployment report. You also have Chairman Powell given testimony here, uh, not testimony, but given a speech on Friday as well. So we do have some economic activity, as I indicated earlier today, uh, regarding the central banks around the world. If you just click on all the currencies here and you click on the central bank and let's apply that filter, you can see Australian reporting their interest rate policy on Monday night. That's supposed to be at 1.5%. Then you have the Bank of Canada rate statement coming out on Wednesday, and the ECB is reporting on Thursday as well, monetary policy. And I don't believe Mario Draghi will raise that rate because Mario Draghi doesn't like raising rates. Earnings reports, uh, we already talked about Salesforce. But some of the other major earnings reports I'm looking at this week are Target, Weibo, Kohl's, Sienna Group, Dollar Tree, Abercrombie and Fitch, Burlington Coat Factory, and Kroger all reporting this week, finalizing the retail sector on earnings as we started seeing at the very beginning of last week. Now, in terms of the actual scoreboard for the uh, for the Uh, For the sectors, we downgraded real estate, downgraded staples, downgraded technology, downgraded industrials, just slightly coming into the week. Industrials got the biggest downgrade as Boeing was coming into that 440 mark. We anticipated a little bit of profit taking coming into uh, that overextended area of the market. Industrials have been performing really, really well, but Boeing has really kind of led that charge. So we did downgrade industrials, gave an uptick to the materials sector. I did like the technical formation, as did Tyler Crick, Coach Tyler over there. So we upgraded the materials sector. We upgraded financial a little bit on a potential breakout of a high base type situation. And we gave the dollar a little bit of upgrade. Grade. S&P 500, we kept it the same because it was the exact same between those levels and it will stay at that yardage marker as long as the S&P stays between 2770 and 20, uh, excuse me, 
2820. And looking at the actual technical conditions of these sectors out there, looking at materials first, I got materials in a bullish uptrend forming a bullish retracement hitting its head. And this is why we kind of like it here, ladies and gentlemen. It's got an old pivot here at about $54 to $54.50. It's got a rising 20 day moving average, nice little retracement coming back down into it. Now you do have a falling knife scenario here, guys, three days in a row, big red candles on the downside. We know what we need to wait for. We need to wait for that short boy candle. We need to wait for that slowing momentum candle, upward moving in price. But I do like that sector. That's one of the sectors that I do like coming into the week. Looking at communication sector, still just kind of hanging out there, just kind of hanging out there, forming this same type of, you know, rising wedge type pattern with overhead resistance right around $47. You do have some intraday resistance that you tried to break out above, above 4640, but a lot with the market sold off intraday coming back down into the channel. Energy here, looking at it, was wanting it, wanting it. I like energy right now. I like from a seasonality perspective. I also like financial from a seasonality perspective. They have positive correlation to the market in the month of March. So keep an eye on energy, keep an eye on financial. Those two are historically the best performing sectors over the course of March in the last 20 years, but it hasn't broken out yet. I need to see it get above this 67 handle first. Keep an eye on that energy sector at 67. No aggressive behavior until we see a breakout there, guys. Financial, as, as, we, as we indicated, we did upgrade it as we were coming into that breakout channel. Obviously, the market sold off. You got, it's coming back down into that slightly, bu uh, slightly bullish category. So a little failed breakout in the financial sector today. Industrials, it just needs to pull back. It's just, it, I, I, I don't know if I can say it clearer than that. It needs to pull back. Industrials have been driven based on Boeing. Boeing is completely overextended to the point of 2017 overextended. Boeing needs to pull back. Industrials need to pull back. Give me a nice little pullback down into that 74 type level to, to, to reset that trend on the industrial sector. Looking at technology here. Technology, same thing with uh, same thing with industrials. These two sectors have been, been performing very, very, uh, very, very similar. They're correlated with one another right now, as 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 they have both been since the Chinese trade war really kind of started. It's the industrial sector, it's the technology sector that is prone to a lot of these trade wars. And so you're getting a little overextended on both of them. Give me a pullback. You do have a little high base breakout at $70 here. You also have uh, support uh, levels down here between 68 and 68.50. It's not pulling back yet. One day is not a pullback. One day is not a retracement. One day is not a pivot. And so we de it's still forming a little bit of the, the uh, similar to the S&P 500 in that high base type situation. So let's let the technology sector play itself out. Consumer staples, we gave it a downgrade. Don't like the slowing momentum. Don't like the decreasing interday resistance levels. If you drop this down into a 30 minute chart, you can see those decreasing resistance levels on the intraday chart. It's forming what is called a, right, a, a, a flag type pattern. It doesn't have the same probability as a high base. Look for this to retrace a little bit deeper in my estimation. Real estate, we downgraded as well, just given we're seeing a lot of slowing momentum. And like we said, we have a lot of economic reports this week that impact this sector. So we just gave it a little bit of a downgrade this week simply because it's overextended. It's forming a high base type uh, neutrality type situation where we need to see price move out of the range or under the range for any trading to happen. And then you have those economic factors that are going to impact real estate. You Utilities, we gave a little bit of an upgrade just simply because we, we liked a little bit of a rising wedge type situation. Obviously, felt breakout right here. A little bit of concern for the utilities. But when I was looking at all those scatter reports, Tim, I'll tell you what, four or five picks, four or five stocks stood out to me on the utilities. Now, we don't swing trade utilities at tackle trading, but we do invest in utilities because of dividend and they are safety. But I did see some, I did, I did see a lot of good technical patterns in the, in the utility sector that gave me a little bit of a hope for this sector that otherwise I did not have on some of the other sectors in the market. Healthcare, I am just, con I, you know, I, I love healthcare, but I am concerned about healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, last week uh, on the Hill was very, very damaging to healthcare. I played this out before with the 2016 election when Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders were all over the healthcare movement. And quite frankly, rightly so. Healthcare expenses are out of the 
universe when it comes to cost and inflationary cost right now. So, so it does need some regulation, in my opinion. I hope it gets regulated in, in, uh, from a U.S. consumer perspective. And you're seeing a lot of choppy action right here. When, when, when the Hill, when Congress is focused on something, guys, we want to kind of stay away from that. That increases uh, variables in the equation that we don't know how it's going to impact. So when Congress has its eye on something, guys, we really don't want to kind of focus there because Congress uh, can, can really kind of drive price action through regulations. And then finally, the consumer discretionary sector looking very similar to that of the S&P 500 range found between 110 and 112. We need to see a breakout one way or the other. A breakout of 112 would be a legit breakout, in my opinion. But again, all these breakouts have to have confirmation, which is a close above those levels. A breakdown underneath 110 would form a bullish retracement and would have to let that shake out. You know, as I look at the intraday on the market, Matt, trying to find a bottom here, uh, go back to the S&P as we kind of wrap up the show, you know, five minute chart, intraday chart, 15 minute chart, anything like that. You know, down here on these green candles, that might just be a little snapback profit taking from day traders. Uh, we're going to have to watch this close. But this is one day at the start of the week. Anything from this bottoming action here? What do you expect? No, I'm just not shocked that the bottom formed at 2770, which we've talked about for a week and a half. There you go. Let's there let's let go. that see. This is not a buying opportunity, guys. That is not a buying opportunity. That is short covering is what that is. Yeah. This candle is not the the yeah, the, the specific robot. signal was on the one minute fifty uh, yeah. period moving average. Whenever it clears that on the one minute chart, a lot of short takers get out. Short term computers, just technical stuff that happens in day trading. Yeah, I I, I, I don't I don't see a I, I don't see a good trading environment right now. Let's let it shake out. But that there's a reason twenty seven seventy is seventy is held after this price move down here, it is historical support levels uh, for the last couple of weeks. That's I had a really interesting, you guys will like this, news thing come across my headlines while uh, you were doing your recap of the sectors. EA, Apex of Legends, just hit 50 million subscribers in the first 30 days. That is a three times faster rate than Fortnite did. Mark, 50 million, I was talking Apex to of Legends. I was talking to a bunch of gamers the other night about about EA and and uh, Apex Legends, and when I said it's a similar game to Fortnite, they lost their mind. They lost <laughs> their mind. I mean? got kicked out of the group chat. <laughs> oh, of course, the, the, the group chat is my son and two of his friends. Yeah, <laughs> listen. At it's some okay. point, the market is going to get really excited about that number. Well, here, here's not my today, opinion. though, Mark. EA's not running. You know? No, but but I'm excited about it's that. And I'm also excited about EA really kind of forming, uh, playing defense at 95. Yeah. The only, uh, But I just come back to this one thing. The Tackle 25 Mastermind Group this month, we're going to be going over the, the, the Tackle 25 for the first couple months of the year. And on March 1st, it, it, March is when we kind of analyze that first cut line. Yeah. And this year is the first time we're making changes to the Tackle 25 quarter by quarter by quarter. So in March, we're going to analyze the, the Tackle 25 and make decisions based on not technical conditions technically, but more from an earnings perspective and a fundamental uh, perspective. And the debate that I'm having internally over the last few weeks in my head, guys, is Activision from a cover call perspective or EA, and to me, I, I, I'm very close to, to have an Activision being the first company to get kicked off the Tackle 25 mid-year. I'm very I close. Kicked it, I kicked it off three weeks ago. So Yeah, like, but you kicked it off from a trading perspective. No, it, I kicked it. The company sucks. Well, I don't know if the company sucks. No, I, they are. They have totally went into defense. We're not going to create anything new. Let's fire people. Let's buy back. That company's a yeah. mess right now. It, yeah. it, it is, but I, I personally think Activision is still fundamentally a better company than uh, EA, regardless of what has happened in the last two months, regardless of what has happened with Apex Legends. So, so it's gonna. It, I, I, I'm not gonna remove Activision simply because Activision's went down in the month versus EA went up in a month. That's not how fundamental value and and growth investors play this. 
And so, you know, as, as the markets go down or up, you shouldn't just overreact to one technical condition and one short-term trend. I still believe that Activision is fundamentally a better company than, than Electronic Arts. It's a harder debate though right now, Matt, when they lost that Bungie relationship, that obviously throws uh, a wrench into their yeah. future earnings prospects and whatnot. It is a much more complex debate than it was, say, two months ago when they had that deal, right? It, yes, it is. But companies lose deals but they don't, they don't just go to zero. Yeah, no, it's not going to zero. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I mean, I get destiny is an important game. I, I do understand destiny is an important game. You know what else is an important game? Diablo. You know what else is an important game? Warcraft and Activision owns both. So, yeah. so, so Activision it, to me is in a better, better fundamental perspective than EA. EA is better short term. I still think Activision is better long term. I could, I, I, I and again, I have not came to my conclusion yet. That's just what I'm working out in my Listen, head. I like Activision. When it hits $28, I'll probably look to buy some. <laughs> there better be a historical support level at 28 somewhere. <laughs> I got, I, I, I'll tell you, 35. There you go, 35. I ain't buying at 35. All right. Onboarding for new students tonight. If you're new to tackle trading in our community, make sure you attend that with Coach Frank. Uh, the Tackle 25 Mastermind Group, Matt, will be Wednesday night. So yeah. we will have updates on those lists and we'll be communicating that with uh, with those students who are taking that system and going through that course as well. Uh, tomorrow, Coach's show, but pretty much every day here, we're going to be in the halftime report, Matt, day by day. Any last thoughts here, boys? No, good show. Good show. Good job, Mark. Good job, Cody. Good job, Matt. Tackle Trading Halftime Crew, come here every day and join us just to break down the daily routine, break down the information in the market. That way you don't have to rely on Reuters giving you bad news headlines. I got to go back and look up all the Reuters headlines from last I, week. I just can't wait. To, uh, I can't wait for 15 minutes from now when the market finds support at 2770, starts appreciating and Reuters comes out. Market back up on positive trade deal. <laughs> Say love you. It's just, it's just insane. Hey, if you didn't get enough of Matt and Tim, which, hey, why would you have gotten enough of Matt and Tim in one hour? Trading Justice podcast will be released for this week, either later today or uh, early tomorrow. It's always, it's always Monday night. And we always release it Monday night for, uh, I know you guys, I, I, any podcast listener, we're all the same. We, we get in our routines and the, the you podcast. You start getting antsy when it doesn't come out on time. You're like, where's I, the I'm podcast? Telling you, I'm telling you, I, I go to my podcast app and I'm like, refresh, 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 right? And so there's, there's a podcast I listen to that comes out Sunday night. There's a podcast I listen to that comes out Monday night. It's called the Trading Justice Podcast. Everybody look that one up. There's a podcast I listen to on Tuesday and, and you just get into these routines with it. So the podcast will be released every, every Monday night for you guys for your Tuesday commute. Uh, so definitely go out there download that and as always in the podcast we do the market skyline we do a feature presentation and then we'd like to have a little bit of game a little bit of fun activity as well and if you do love that podcast make sure you go to itunes and give us a nice little uh, five-star review boeing intraday w pattern breakout uh you cannot beat that company down uh we'll have to review it tomorrow <laughs> four, hey, four, listen 425 is an intraday support level Look at that. Aye, aye. So, so no, that's just the bearish retracement on the retracement developing. All right, guys, we will see you tomorrow. Halftime report at tackletrading.com.